Hey, Giants fans, this is Chris Franklin from NJ Advance Media, alongside with Giants beat reporter Daryl Slater, and welcome to Talk is Cheap, the pocket podcast where we discuss all things related to the New York Giants. Now, before we begin, I want to remind you that you can read our content or nj.com slash Giants and make sure to bookmark that to get the latest Giants news and analysis. Today, we're going to talk about a variety of topics ranging from the Malik Neighbors injury to surprise camp standout so far and who's in trouble early on to make the roster. But first off, Daryl, um, this is kind of new talking to you on this podcast, but I, I'm looking forward to doing this, man. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Chris, man. Uh, good to good to catch up with you, obviously, for people um, who don't who don't know. So folks who've been listening for a little bit. Um, Andy Vasquez, our Jets writer, and I have been doing this for a little while. Um, and a- Andy's actually not going to be doing it anymore. Chris will be hosting our Eagles podcast and our Giants podcast now. And we actually have a new uh, Giants writer, Ryan Novozinski, who did a great job covering the Devils for us. So Ryan will be covering the de- the uh, Devils with, or the the, the, the uh, Giants rather with me. So every other week, it'll be either me and Chris or Ryan and Chris on this podcast. Uh, you know, once the season gets rolling, we'll do them uh, a couple more here in the preseason. And then once the season gets rolling, we'll make it, you know, a weekly thing as usual. And so Chris will be captaining the ship and doing an awesome job of, of leading both this podcast and our Eagles podcast. And, and he's been doing the Eagles for a while. And I'm sure, man, you're going to, you're going to do an awesome job doing this. So like, yeah, excited to uh, excited to talk with you and catch everybody up on where things are here as we talk on uh, Monday evening. The, the 12th of august here at 13 practices in yeah, okay so where do i send the venmo to you for that introduction man because that was too nice in terms of that <laughs> well i i appreciate you having me on now seriously man it's been been reading from you from afar and, and and known you for a while now and this is this is really cool to actually be able to do this with you so thanks again thanks for the intro and i'm looking forward to working with you and ryan ryan's another great writer you know mentioned his network with the devils and this is gonna be a lot of fun so this let's get this started uh, I guess we're going to start out first off now. Uh, I think everybody had a little scare this week, especially on Sunday, when they noticed that the news about wide receiver Malik Neighbors, the talented first-round wide receiver, first-round pick, who was expected to finally provide Daniel Jones a legitimate outside weapon. Well, he suffered a minor injury, you know, dealing with a left spra- a sprained left ankle during Sunday's practice. And, Daryl, we know what it is nothing long-term that's going to affect him in that. But how would this impact his development and do you think that, you know, if he has to miss a couple practices or two, what receivers could use his absence as a chance to springboard their chances to improve their standing on the roster? Yeah, well, I mean, the good news for the Giants is that this is not does not appear to be a long term injury. And Brian Dable said today that the x-rays were negative. So no fracture there. They're, they're still doing some more tests, which presumably would be an MRI. Um to determine sort of the severity of the sprain. They think it's a, it's a minor ankle sprain. And, and the, the difference here would be that would be a lateral low ankle sprain as opposed to a high ankle sprain. Right. So uh, it seems like he, all systems go for week one still for him. That's about four weeks out. Um, I would be shocked if he played in Houston in the second preseason game. And so the issue there is, you know, if he doesn't play in that game, will Daniel Jones play in the preseason finale or not? And if Daniel Jones doesn't, uh, how will the, lack of game experience between those guys affect their chemistry or lack thereof during the season. So that's something to watch. I mean, they've gotten a ton of work together in camp. So um, I don't know if it's one of those things where you could use it as an excuse all year long, but maybe they could get off to a little slow start. I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's still too early to say, but at this point, they they really did dodge the worst case scenario with this, with this injury. Um, It's not one of those things that look bad per se. He just, rolled it on Sunday. He walked off the field. They looked at it. It wasn't anything where it was catastrophic appearing. Um, as far as the other guys who could get reps, I mean, look, uh, right now, Darius Slayton and, D- and Jalen Hyatt are listed as or, you know, on the top line of the depth chart. People see that, you know, right? there's one guy or it's or, right? And so there's a big OR between those two guys on the depth chart. And I was talking to Mike Grow, the receivers coach, yesterday, and he was saying, uh, both those guys will be heavily involved, but let's be honest. I mean, there's a difference between being the number two outside receiver and, and the number three guy in terms of how many reps you're going to get. You're going to have Wandale Robinson in the slot. So do they go with Slayton or who, a guy who is, I'm shocked he's still even around here, um, or uh, <laughs> Jalen Hyatt. Um, so who gets to know? I think it'll probably be a week to week thing, but that's the more reps for those guys for sure. Uh, starters are going to play Saturday and uh, that's something to look for for sure. 
Yeah, you mentioned it, it about that chemistry. That's very, very important because we all know in NFL, those windows, those throwing windows, they're very, very tough to try to fit it through. And when you don't have uh, that wide receiver, you don't have Daniel Jones throwing the neighbors and those little and tweaking those little routes, the slant routes, especially all those timing routes where you need to go one, two, three, boom. You don't have that. It really messes things up. And you got to worry about, especially the first two games that the Giants have come out the gate. You look at the Vikings and at home, and then you look, they have to go to commanders whose defense is good as well, too. You worry about that a little bit, trying to roll on. You're trying to make it work as it goes along. So it's something to bear watching as well, too. You mentioned Darius Slayton. I was from watching from afar, you know, it seems like the guy has some talent, but the fact that he hasn't gotten it together this 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 latest career and doing it consistently at this point now, it kind of has me questioning, like I'm worried about where he's going to stand and, and everything like that in this offense. But it's, it's it's something intriguing to watch as we roll along for this rest of this preseason in terms of that. For sure. I mean, Slayton is a solid but not spectacular receiver. That's 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 fine. That's what he is. I mean, he's an overachieving fifth round pick. He can do some good things for you. Hyatt's a skinny kid who's a deep threat, um, a little bit one dimensional, speed guy, deep guy. But you know, Malik Neighbors is a five tool guy. That's why he was a six overall pick, and that's how that's how Mike Grow described him: five tool player. Um, just like the baseball analogy, he can do everything: intermediate yards after catch, deep ball, all that stuff. So he's obviously the huge difference maker, and they need him on the field. Every play of every game, pretty much, and they're going to target him a ton. We'll see how he responds to getting uh, attention from the opposing number one cornerback guys who are the grown men every week. This kid's 21. So um, that'll be a fascinating thing to watch as the year goes on. And, but, you know, the, the good thing I, the Giants, for Giants fans and the Giants themselves, is that, you know, they're going to get to, barring some crazy setback, they're going to get to see that from week one. So we'll see how it goes. Nice, nice. Now we're going to stay on the office, offensive side of the ball now. Daniel Jones is undoubtedly the starting quarterback, and after we paid him that much money, yeah, he better be at the end of the day. And it forced, you know, Saquon Barkley to walk and, and that whole entire situation. However, there's a case for the backup quarterback job is you look at that he's going to miss time, in case he misses time again, you know. Drew Locke was brought in to replace him in, in, instead of Tyrod Taylor. Well, Drew Locke didn't have the best night as opposed to his preseason debut against the Carolina Panthers. He only completed four of his 10 passes for 17 yards. He rushed twice for 12 yards. And to make matters worse, he was injured and diagnosed with deep bone bruise in his hip. And it's going to sideline him a bit. And he may be a few, day, a few weeks, maybe he'll be ready for week one. I'm still waiting to see that. Now, from what, you, from what you've seen, Daryl, do you feel comfortable with Drew Locke still being the, quarter, the second quarterback? Should Tommy DeVito take over you know, and remain, remain in that role? Or do you think the quarterback that's a quarterback on the market, such as Ben Nanucci, A.J. McCarron, or dare I say even Ryan Tannehill, which still kind of shocks me he's still out there, do you think that the, the Giants will target one of them even though they're, they have, they're struggling with the cap right now? No, I don't think they'll do that, and I don't think DeVito will be the backup. I mean, DeVito is – I mean, come on. Like, I, like I think he, he, he's a developmental player. He did some good things last year for all of Drew Locke's f- faults, and there are many, and flaws, and there are many. Um, it, it, it's clear that Locke is much more experienced, much more savvy than Tommy DeVito. And so Locke is dealing with this hip injury coming out of the game the other night when he got horrendous pass protection from what is a, a brutal Giants backup offensive line. And they better hope that nobody on their – starting line gets hurt because that is going to be a disaster if if they have to play one or two backups and so yeah i i think the lock is in their system now they paid him money to be their backup quarterback not the type of money tyra taylor got from the jets but um they invested in him and he's he's going to be their guy uh, obviously so um yeah i think there's not there's no uncertainty there you know the uncertainty comes in one thing that Andy and I have talked about and I've written about a bunch is, you know, do they put Daniel Jones in bubble wrap at some point this season um, and go ahead and start Locke, who clearly is not better than Jones? And what's what's that telling you? And so um, uh, do they do that because of the injury guarantee? We've been over it a bunch. Um, 
if you know you're going to cut them, blah, 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 with the injury guarantee. Everyone knows what, what I'm referring to, of course. And so that's for down the road, obviously. But I think for now, um, you need a healthy backup and a capable backup, especially when your starter is has had as many durability issues as Daniel Jones. And uh, so they absolutely need Drew Locke healthy week one. They do. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Um, and it looks like he will be. He has he said today he has no doubt he'll be ready for week one. And uh will not play Saturday. I mean, there's no way he's playing in Houston. They're going to throw Tommy DeVito to the Wolves for, you know, <laughs> maybe oh, for luck. a half or maybe three quarters. The kid's been throwing so much, his arm's going to fall off, I think. And so uh, that's where they're at with uh, with quarterback situation. They're not bringing in a third quarterback. They got Tyree Jackson, a tight end who played quarterback at Buffalo's emergency. He's not playing quarterback in the game. Everyone's like – going nuts about it or whatever like it's not even barely even worth acknowledging he's the emergency third quarterback um so anyway that's that's where it is I, this whole yeah I, I lock is what he is i mean then they wanted to bring back tyra taylor which to me is a little bit delusional because why would he come back you know you, you benched him kept him on the bench essentially for tommy devito you know and so he went to the jets got good money and uh but yeah, that's where the Giants are at in terms of those two notable injuries with Neighbors and Locke. Obviously, Neighbors much more notable. Um, no for this weekend for both guys. So just say what it is for now. No, they're not playing. Neither guy's going to play, period. Even though they've they've not really fully ruled out Neighbors, there's no way they're rushing him back. And Brian Dable today essentially ruled out Drew Locke. So, uh, but yes for week one. I think it's a definitive no for this weekend, definitive yes for week one, which is which is fine. Not bad. Yeah, it is. I mean, I remember watching Tyree Jackson, you know, when he was with the Eagles, and there's no way that I, there's a reason why he switched from quarterback to tight end. And it's not just not an NFL caliber quarterback, in, in my opinion, in terms of that. And I look, I look at Drew Locke, and he's an interesting case. I mean, I think if like if the Giants didn't have the issues they had along their offensive line, he very much could be a decent, decent starter. I don't think he'll be anything to write home about. If I had to put him, I'd probably put him in the back end of the 20s because we all know how there's a lack of depth in terms of a quarterback player in this league right now. And he's, he's a guy that can, you think if you, if you give him protection and give him the right time, he can make a majority of the throws. He can maybe win you a game or two. I mean, certainly you saw it last year when he was with the Seattle Seahawks and when they beat the Eagles in terms of ma- and making those play, big plays. It surprised me a little bit in terms of that as well, too. But I think that Locke has the tools in order to do it. You just need to give him some time, as you mentioned. So it's something that they, they, they'll need him for sure. I mean, Tommy DeVito, that was a nice story last year. You know, everybody doing the hand gestures and, hey, look at this. It gives all the Italian food, whatever, or have you, and all that stuff to bring in. But after a while, yeah, I think it, it's time, he is what he is, and, and it's time to move on in terms of that. Now, moving on to uh, the training camp. You know, there's always a camp darling, a, a dark horse that always seems to come out of nowhere every year. And now that, you know, we were past the, the first game and have been multiple practices, I wanted to ask you, are there any potential surprise candidates that you think will make this roster? Yeah, I think um... – there's an an interesting kid in Elijah Chatman, C H A T. He's an undrafted rookie out of uh, SMU, Southern Methodist, and uh, he has been getting some. He's a D lineman. He's been getting some, getting some run um, with the ones. Not he's not going to be a starter, but they're, they're you know they're working him in. Obviously, he's not going to be a starter. I mean, they have Brian Burns, Dexter <laughs> Lawrence, Raheem Nunez, Roaches, and Kevin Thibodeau. Everyone knows what their front is, but you look at. The depth there, they're looking for a third or fourth um, defensive tackle. And the other guys are not necessarily proven. You're talking about Jordan Riley, Ryder Anderson. Okay. Uh, Anderson, probably the third guy there. But who's the fourth? Are you, you Jordan Riley, Jordan Phillips, DJ Davidson, or, or, or Chapman could make a case for that job? I think absolutely he could. So he's been an interesting interesting guy to watch who has emerged another another undrafted rookie I and mean, i'm not saying these guys have been you know superb stars there last year the, the the kid who was had the you know the a lot of attention was trey herndon and they started in week one it didn't turn out well he's an earnest kid and he, he was their six he was a six round pick uh, obviously and so Trey Hawkins, I said Trey Herndon, man. There's a kid I named Trey Herndon on the roster right now, but Trey Hawkins is obviously who I was referring to. So the uh, he was sort of the camp darling last year, and, and we saw how that we saw how that turned out. Um, n- not great, um, and so he's he's okay, fine. He's back up in the NFL as a six round pick, and, and that's sort of 
that's fine. And so will any will you know Chapman's contributions here? What will they result in? Um, who knows? But he's done some positive things. Another kid is Jake Kubis, uh, an under another undrafted rookie. He went to North Dakota, North Dakota State. Let's see. So he went to um, North Dakota State, which obviously is is a FCS power. They may be an FBS now. I don't know, but they really good um, sort of smallish school football program that has produced, you know, Carson Wentz, obviously, and so among others. And he has been running as basically um, the number. I, I maybe going to be the, the the second backup guard. If you look at Aaron Stinney as the, as the primary backup guard, um, John Runyon got hurt today. The, the left guard, we'll see how serious that is. This, I mean, this line can't catch a break in terms of continuity. The, 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 the five guys they're going to roll out for week one, if, if they had their way, obviously you go left to right. Andrew Thomas, John Runyon, John Michael Schmitz, who's dealing with a shoulder injury. Then at right guard, Greg Van Roten, and then Jermaine Illuminor. Well, now Runyon's hurt. We'll see how serious it is. Um, and so they need some depth, certainly, at a guard, and that's where Stinney and maybe Jay Kubas comes in. John Michael Schmitz, who is not good last year as a rookie, the center, second-round pick. Um, yeah, uh, he's got a shoulder injury. He's working his way back, hasn't practiced in team period since day three of camp. I don't think this is going to threaten week one for him, but you know we'll see how much work this – because so that's why Kubis is getting some looks here because all these injuries um, and, and, and ditto for Stinney early on in camp, but they're phasing him out, which is, which is fine. Um, he's not, you know, he's not a preferred starter. And so I think that the lack of continuity here in camp could be something to watch early on with this line. And that's, that's the group where you want to get these five guys working together. I mean, Brian Dable straight up said it. They wanted to get their five set as early as possible. We're 13 practices in one preseason game into this thing. And, and they have not, the five preferred guys have not taken one single snap together yet. That some now, some of that's because they signed Van Roten into camp, but also remember, I mean, day three of camp is when uh, Schmitz hurts his shoulder, same one he hurt last year. Um, and uh, that's that's sidelined him from team periods, at least since. He's not, again, he's working his way back. So, yeah, I think that those are a couple guys who, who have done some interesting things. Um, you know, any of the other players who have emerged, like obviously Isaiah Simmons playing slot corner, everyone knows who he is. It's a new role for him. Deontay Johnson's an interesting one and the inside linebacker, another undrafted guy who could, he's on the roster bubble because there's some, there's kind of a log jam there um, in terms of the special teams, uh, special teams ability of some of the backup inside linebackers. Um, But he's certainly a guy who could stick around in the practice squad as a developmental dude. And so that's, yeah, I think those would be the guys. Yeah, I think it's, it's – I'm really curious about Elijah Chapman, like you mentioned earlier, you know, because we know Shane Bowen, you know, it, when you look at his defenses, they're very – they're usually historically pretty good against the run. And when you look at his history as well, too, being at Kennesaw State and, and from where he deals with a lot of linebackers, and the last thing he wants to see is his linebackers getting caught by guys in the second level by guards and, and then all their offensive linemen and – just turning around there, keeping that defense on on there. So the fact that Chapman is getting these looks, and yeah, when it's, even if it's a rotational guy, it's going to be pretty pretty important for him to potentially get a role there. And he could he could really could sneak onto that roster. Now, conversely, you know, who what players do you think you know should be looking over their shoulder and? Who, is there, are there any that you know should be starting to look at, start, start considering? You know, should they start looking elsewhere for for apartments or anything else in another city because their time might be done with the Giants. <laughs> Well, I mean, in terms of the notable um, names, I mean, there's no way Allen Robinson's making this roster. No way. I mean, they, they, really? <laughs> none. No, I don't. I don't <laughs> think he makes the roster. I mean, you got Jalen Hyatt, Darius Slayton, right? Wandale Robinson. That's three. Malik Neighbors. That's four. Probably Isaiah Hodgins is ahead of him. That's five. Then. You're either keeping Gunnar Olszewski or, or Isaiah McKenzie uh, as as another um, receiver. Okay, so maybe he sneaks on on the on the back end, um, or does Bryce Ford Wheaton, who's had some trouble staying healthy, does he get on ahead of him? Um, Miles Boykin. I mean, these are guys who are all getting more work 
more and done more than than Robinson has. I, I would be surprised if he makes the roster based on what I've seen in camp because he doesn't have special teams value. In terms of Joe Shane draft picks, um, Look, this is something to watch because the Giants now are in year three under Joe Shane, right? And every GM wants to rebuild through the draft. It's the thing they always say. Look at the 2022 draft for, for, for Joe Shane. Obviously, Kayvon Thibodeau is going to be around, obviously. Uh, well, big year for him. Evan Neal, you know, he's a bust, but he'll be around the roster. Wyndale Robinson working down the list. Wyndale Robinson, Josh Zudu, Cordell Flott. Daniel Bellinger, Dane Belton, Mike McFadden, those guys are all are all safe, obviously. Um, now, Josh Zudu has a lot of flaws. Cordell Flott, you know, is he going to be the starting outside corner or is it going to be Nick McLeod? I think Flott's dealing with a quad that could that could really set him back in terms of being the guy opposite Deontay Banks. Um, Dane B- Daniel Bellinger, maybe he's not even the starting tight end. Maybe it's Theo Johnson. Um Anyway, Belton, we know he's the free safety right now, but Tyler Newman can push him. And I don't need to review everybody with Micah McFadden, but look, DJ Davis is probably on the roster bubble. Mike, M- M- Marcus McKeith in a, a 2022 fifth round pick, there is no way he's making the team. He's gone. Uh, Darian Beavers, uh, he he was buried on the practice squad last year after he got passed by McFadden in you know, training camp. And I think – there's a good chance he gets caught too. Now, could he land on the practice squad again? Sure. Could McEaton? Sure. But I think those guys uh, are certainly two notable names to watch, at least in terms of Joe Shane draft picks, who, who are probably on the outside looking in right now on the cut uh, list. Those, are, those would be the notable names, I think. I think anyone else that I would list for you would be someone where people might say who, you know, <laughs> like even Giants fans. But, uh, Darnay Holmes has moved to outside corner and has special teams value. And so I think that he's added some value for himself there because there's a, there's a little bit more room for him there than there was in the slot, which is the spot where he has uh, typically played. Well, he almost entirely played throughout his career. So um, I would have thought he was a guy who could get caught, but at this point I don't think so just because he's, he's one of their backup outside corners. Now, now here's a question I have in terms of Allen Robinson. Oh, and will Devito get cut? That I mean, or stash him on the practice squad? I think yes. I think they cut him and put him, keep him on the practice squad. No one's claiming him. <laughs> yeah, I, I doubt that. Yeah, you bring him up, bring him up for the three times if you need him, and just go for, go with that one there. But, but I, I, you mentioned Allen Robinson. And I just had this question in terms of that. You know, we saw he had that. He, he hasn't really produced since he's left the Bears. Twenty twenty two, he had three hundred thirty nine yards, and then he had a foot injury. He went to the Steelers last year, 34 catches, 280 yards. Why were the Giants interested in signing him in the first place? Yeah, right. Great question. <laughs> I mean, um, look, the guy is washed, I think, at this point. He's he's not that old. He's, he's, he's going to turn 31 in, in 12 days. So I guess a little old for a, a receiver. But I think they just – Took a flyer on it, but but good point there. Why not just use the spot on a younger player, right? Um, I mean, it's a it's a one year deal, one point three. It's it's one of those veteran salary benefit deals. Um, so his base is one three. It's not guaranteed. The cap number is one, just north of one, and they they only give him a twenty five thousand dollars signing bonus. Um, so clearly, there's no commitment there, but. Your point is well taken. Why why do that? I mean, I guess they thought, you know, maybe he would be a guy if they if they decided to move on from Darius Slayton for whatever reason or trade him. Um, but they're not comparable players at this point in their careers. So uh, Robinson certainly had some solid years, but he is on the very much on the downside of his career. And I think that uh, – yeah, will will he resurface after the after the Giants inevitably or likely cut him? Um, you know, we'll see. I'm about to say, like you could right now, if we the Giants could sign you right now, you can could be competing in camp right now if you wanted to get, probably put the same numbers up. I mean, do you have any eligibility left? Maybe you can go and do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, he's my height. There you go. We're the same height, six, six two. That's about it. That's the only thing I have in common with him. But maybe I'm pushing two twenty. I don't know these days. But uh, he, uh, <laughs> so yeah. Look, I mean, like, I, he has not just not done anything in camp. Not done anything. It's just just has really gone on un- no unnoticed. Just because the, there's just been he hasn't. He's been hurt. 
not like he's been bad. Certainly has been great. Just hasn't really done anything. So, um, yeah, a curious one, an interesting one for sure, as you said. All right. I'll, I'll start looking at it. And if you need some practice to catch some 50-50 balls, we're, we'll, we'll find a field somewhere and start throwing around that way, too. <laughs> All right. We're, we're, we're coming up to the end of our first podcast, man. And, and first off, this is once again, this is great doing this with you. And, and, and thanks for taking the time, man. But now, you know, we're on the opposite sides of the turnpike. You know, you're up there north. I'm down here right now. I'm recording right now in our Mullica Hill office in South Jersey. But I've always liked your coverage and, and watching the team from far. I mentioned that earlier as well, too. Now that you cover Giants training camps for a bit now, has there been a moment that sticks out to you in terms of training camp itself? And can you give some insight to the people listening? You know, what's this like covering this team during a training camp? Yeah, well, thanks, man. I appreciate you saying that. Um the, the big so 13 practices into this thing and a preseason game obviously the biggest storyline for the Giants has been the emergence of Malik neighbors and not really even the emergence I mean this kid has been everything they thought he was going to be he's been spectacular in, in training camp now will that mean he has an amazing rookie year like they're depending on him to carry their offense it's a lot to ask it's a and especially there's no other feared weapons on this offense they're asking going to ask a ton of him they're going to target him a ton teams will play a lot of attention to him because of what I just said about them not having any other feared weapons so there are just uh, a, a lot of things that could be um, pulling on him in terms of pulling him back. Um, a super talented young man. Uh, the you know, the craziest moment, the most notable moment, is certainly those two joint practices with the Lions, which were two of the most insane practices I think I've ever seen. In, in an absurd number of fights on day one. I've never seen anything like that, you know, in 10 plus years covering the NFL. And then the second day, not as many fights, but then at the very end of practice and neighbors just sets the whole thing off by popping Kirby Joseph in the face for no reason. And that's the full Malik neighbors experience. I mean, he makes me make great plays throughout those two practices, but just the ferocity and the intensity. And it's sometimes, you know, unharnessed, unhinged, um, not ideal, obviously, in a game to have that happen, um, but that's what they wanted. They knew that they they had this this kid had a lot of dog in him, and they liked that, and they saw that certainly in that practice. So that's been the moment um, for sure um, that stuck out, um, and fans were there for it. They got to see it. It was it was a wild WWE like scene. You know, fans were cursing at the lines. It was it was pretty cool. It was. I mean, wildly entertaining um you know fortunately no one got hurt you don't want to necessarily see guys putting themselves in situations where they, where they could get hurt and they you know they didn't but it's football it's a violent sport and uh it's it's part of the deal and it does it reflect a lack of then they got the both teams got pop 200k for that but does it reflect a, a lack of discipline you know i i think that those things that's certainly a, a a possibility that the use you could say that for sure i think that that's a, a legitimate argument to make um but they there have not been any other really any other fights none like among the giants throughout camp we'll, we'll see on the discipline stuff once the season comes and that that reflects itself more in things like pre-snap penalties something less sexy than like punching another guy in the face in the game because that's just so rare um but yeah that's that's what it's that's been the highlight as far as like what it's, you know, what it's like covering, covering camp. It's, um, I, I don't know. I mean, there's certainly <laughs> a lot of like, you're watching a, a ton of football and a lot of, and a lot of drills. Obviously people who go to the, go to the practices know that they know it, they see it. I mean, it's, it, a lot of it's just pretty slow paced stuff and it, it has to be, it's two hours. They're not going to run these guys ragged for two hours. So you're not seeing football for probably, but like what, maybe 50 minutes of the, of the, of the an hour or so of, if that of the two hours that they're out there and they, and Brian Dable is not practicing them. Um, the full two hours a lot. He did today. He did today and they were in pads and, um, this has been a more rigorous camp. There have been, um, he has, <laughs> whatever the opposite of backed off. He, he has put the pedal down on these guys a little bit more than he, it's not a Joe judge camp, but last year they, they were very, um, hand, um, you know, backed off of these guys in terms of the intensity. And you have to wonder how much that impacted their prepare. I mean, they came on, got waxed 40, nothing week one. So, um, yeah, 
they, there's been a change in that. I've seen, you know, more padded practices. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that the intensity has been greater. Um, they have not run near, I, I hardly have seen them run seven on sevens at all. They did with the Lions, um, but it's been a lot of 11 on 11. And that's been the case going back to the spring. So Brian Dable perhaps trying to set a little bit more of a intense tone and seeing if that, among other changes, including him almost certainly calling the plays, will will lead to better results than a 6-11 and 11 disaster where the coaching staff came apart at the seams and amid co- certainly quarterback attrition as well. So th- those have been a few of the things that I've noticed that maybe – aren't as obvious if you're if you've only maybe went to one camp practice so that's sort of the broad strokes of where things are at. look i mean preseason game number two coming up here this is that the starters are going to get out there and it'll be fascinating to see how those guys uh perform um and if if they're i mean texans are a good team and, and if uh they can hold their own against the texans nice nice well i really appreciate you sharing those insight man because it's always fun to hear what it's like in other camps and how it goes. We get those TV clips here and there, like on NFL Network, what have you. And it, it's fun to hear what happens. You know, it's, it's good to know you guys get two hours of practice. At least we have we're a lot less. <laughs> so, hey, so it's good to hear that happen. And it's good to, for thanks for sharing your insight and what it's like to watch from your eyes. Well, we've reached the end of this episode. I, we want to thank you guys very much for listening to it. You can read Daryl's stuff, nj.com slash Giants once again. Make sure to watch his Twitter feed. He puts out a lot of great content, what's going on there. And also Ryan Novolinsky, he's going to be joining. I get to talk to him next to the next time in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to that as well, too. So for everybody, for Daryl, I'm Chris. Everybody have a good night. See ya.